or by Serge Seveau and Bienville. The rest of the crew moves forward to join them, bringing them the interpreter. D'Eberville raises his hand as a sign of peace. He motions to the brave who have stayed on the shore to have the others come. The brave goes to the chief, and the chief and the elders cautiously advance toward these strange intruders who have come from the great waters. The two parties remain some distance apart. D'Eberville speaks, saying, we are friends to you. Peace and God be with you. A few of the crew advance to about five feet of the chief and his men. They speak to the interpreter with their own scouts with gestures of sign language. The French convey their peaceful intentions. The Indians signal their willingness to cooperate with the voyagers. The Frenchmen with their interpreters go back to D'Eberville and his officers to discuss the situation. The Indians return to the village and engage in a vivid powwow regarding their feelings about these men. The women and children are nervous and are awed by the events taking place. They stay in the background while the young brave continues to beat out a signal on the drum. The Indian woman speaks. The great war chief is coming. I can hear his cries from the woods. He will provoke a battle with these strange men. Their blood and the blood of my people will stain the white sands. O oh, great father, protect us from harm. Give us peace and let us find a way to live in harmony with these strange people. As she speaks, the warriors begin to arrive from the woods to the east. With the great war cries and threatening gestures, they are met by the brave who had first seen the French. He explains to them the happenings on the beach that morning. They are silent for a moment as they hear the news. The warriors, led by the war chief, cry out with all their might for war. <laughs> the war chief, having worked them into a frenzy, brings them under control. Now with their fury pent up and held on a leash by him, they follow the war chief into the village. The chief of the tribe, sensing the danger, leaves the elders and goes to face the threat to his authority. The elders stand between the French and the council crescent. The chief stands and faces his rebellious war chief. The French are not afraid of his action and goes on about the work at hand. Father Douay hands the cross of the Savior to D'Iberville. They walk slowly, and D'Iberville firmly and without hesitation plants the cross in the sand of the New World, claiming this land for the King of France. All the Frenchmen kneel. Father Douay makes the sign of the cross in the air in three directions. The mantle of peace, seemingly in the answer to the Indian woman's prayer, descends upon the beach. White man and red man, for a moment, stand transfixed. D'Iberville, seizing the moment, prays aloud. Holy Father, you have protected us on our long voyage from France. We ask that you guide us now in the new world. We pray, Father, that you will lead us to friendship with the savage in your name. As the French pray, an argument breaks out between the chief and the war chief. The chief, with a gesture, commands the war chief to be silent. He breaks out of the parley and turns to rejoin their elders. The war chief, stung to the core, barely able to control his anger, returns to his warriors and speaks to them. The chief talks briefly with the elders. He raises his hand in peace. The drummer stops drumming. D'Iberville summons the cabin boys to bring the chest of peace offerings. 
They know that he means friendship by presenting the Indians with gifts. The chief motions to D'Iberville and his men to follow to the council fire. When they arrive, he offers D'Iberville the seat to his right. Bienville is offered the seat to the left. When the leaders are seated, the rest stand in respect. But our war chief tells us these white men must go. He speaks of many stories of death and sorrow that have followed the white man wherever he goes. The war chief rises and tries to convince his fellow tribesmen that the French must leave. He entreats them not to make these men welcome. He tells them the stories he has heard about the white man and how they arrived out from the great water to the east bringing death and destruction with them. When he finishes, he sits with great indignation and hostility. The Indians had heard the rumors of these strange men who had come from the east and doubt has been placed by the war chief as the white men sit in their camp at their own council. The medicine man leaps up to fan flames of discord begun by the war chief. He chants with long bellows and tosses a handful of sulfur on the fire to punctuate his anger. He shakes his rattle and waves his medicine stick, telling of the omens of bad fortune if the white eyes are allowed to stay. It is plain to the council that the medicine man supports the war chief's cry for war. I'll take the microphone away. We In answer to the medicine man's display, Diaboville gives a signal to one of his marines who in turn wave a signal flag to the ship offshore. Ooh, I hear the horse. <laughs> the cannon shot alerts the hunting party. They arrive quickly to support the village. The, the Indians react with great Two. agitation. Three. Three. The chief rises and stands in the midst of them, outstretching his arms to calm both sides. D'Iberville, realizing that the time has come to make the move to bring peace, calls for the chest. It is brought to him, and he opens it and shows the gifts he has brought to the Indians. The chest holds knives, beads, mirrors, and muskets. The Indians view all of them with amazement and awe. They begin to whisper among themselves, and as they do so, the French interpreter, prodded on by D'Iberville, tells the council of their good intentions of peace. But the war chief cries out for war paint. The war paint bearer advances to him. The chief, now supported by the elders of the council and very angry at the war chief for this revolt to his authority, rises and takes his stand and forbids the war chief to put on the war paint. The war chief grumbles as the paint bearer follows the chief and is ordered leave the council. The chief stands over the war chief as he orders him to sit before him in submission. He does so. Now the chief calls out for the sacred pipe and the fire bearer. Light it, fire bearer, he tells them. I'll go get you some. Mm -hmm. What's in it? <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> now begins one of the most sacred ceremonies in which two people can take part, the pledge of peace between them. The pipe is handed to the chief by the pipe bearer. It is lit by one of the young maidens given this honor. The chief then stands and offers a prayer of peace. He blows a puff of smoke to the cardinal points. 
to the earth and then to the heavens. He sits and hands the pipe to D'Iberville, who takes a puff and passes it to Bienville, who takes a puff and passes it to his left. The war chief reluctantly smokes, but submits and joins his fellow tribesmen in making the bond of peace with the French. The pipe is then picked up by the pipe bearer and returned to the chief. Let us be joyful and join with our new brothers in celebrating with food and drink. The chief then summons the food and drink bearers. They serve the chief and the Iberville, then move towards the end of the crescent. While the council and the French enjoy themselves in fellowship, the young men and girls of the village begin a ceremonial dance to the beat of the drum. In the scene of peace and cooperation, the French and the Indians begin their history together of building a new land here on this spot 313 years ago. We salute these men, women, and children and honor their memory with this 2012 celebration of the landing of D'Iberville and the discovery of the Louisiana Territory in 1699. <laughs>